Hey guys, Edward here from Edward279, the mixed content creator. Now, I know today isn't any sort of special date or anything, but this week I just decided to take a break from my normal videos and film a science compilation. Why do I say a science compilation? Well, if you look at my channel, most of my vid- the vast majority of my videos are science videos, so it's easy to, f easy to find videos for, for a science compilation shouldn't compare to, to a compilation of, you know, something else. So, the, so without further ado, let's get this compilation started with one of my oldest videos. Photosynthesis Oversimplified. So, now I know this is a little bit weird for my videos, but I'll give you 10 seconds to guess what in the world this thing is. Time's up. Time's up. Uh, if you haven't already guessed, this is one of the most chem important chemical reaction, chemical equations for life to exist. This, this is none other than, other than, than the humble photosynthesis equation. But now you're question you might be questioning what is photosynthesis and why is it so important? Well, well this video's got your back like on photosynthesis. It's got your back when it comes to photosynthesis. Because I know a lot more than or about this about this crucially important process that then then that meets the because there's much more about this crucially important process that meets the eye than that meets the eye so first off where off who performs photosynthesis photosynthesis is performed by the following is performed by the following plants Algae and weirdly enough, of certain bacteria. They are also photosynthesized for nutrition, for their nutrition. Now, now, now the definition of photosynthesis. To understand the definition of anything. Thing. We need to break up the word. First up, the photo part. Photo means, in this term, in this terminology, means light. So, what? <coughs> thanks. So, photo means light. Synthesis, and the synthesis part. Synthesis, the synthesis part comes from synthesize. Hey, okay, so which definition is to, is to make? So, you know, the basic definition of photosynthesis, so the oversimplified definition, it of photosynthesis is to make something with light. Okay, now photosynthesis... This is, seems pretty simple, and it is. Yes. yes. But now let's... Let's explain it and actually explain it in detail. So, now, as far as, as plants are concerned, and here's all you need to know. Plants perform, 
plants perform photosynthesis in their leaves. Perform photosynthesis in their leaves. Which is the background reason why... Which is not not the full answer to why... Which, by the way, is not the full answer to why leaves are green, but is part of the puzzle. I'll make a video on le on why leaves are green in the future. Sure. Sure. So there... So, well, now let's get, get to actually explaining ning, ning photosynthesis. There are three key ingredients that you need for photos. There are three key ingredients for photosynthesis. It's this. Ingredient number one. Water. Every live, living organism needs it, needs it, and plants are no exception. Ingredient number two. Carbon dioxide. This is why trees are often used, to, are, are thought of as a common solution to climate change. Because trees use up carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and, pho and carbon dioxide just so happens to be one of the world's most powerful greenhouse gases. The third and final ingredient, sunlight. This helps plant... Sunlight helps plants convert the water and carbon dioxide... side into glucose which they use as fuel. Well, and also and 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 this pro process also produces produces oxygen as a byproduct. That which is why why house plants are often used to fill to the air to get to the air because house those photosynthesis get photosynthesis gets rid of any contaminants and pumps out fresh oxygen. Okay, I already showed you the showed you the photosynthesis equation, but let me write it in words for you. For you. For you. As I as you know, water and carbon di water and carbon dioxide react with sunlight. With sunlight react with sunlight in a plant's leaves leaves to make glucose glucose and oxygen as well as water as well as less water from any leftovers from any leftovers. So now, now we'll really get into how this process works. All the, re the ingredients for photosynthesis are in the environment. How do they get... So that brings up a question. How do the, the materials they need for photosynthesis... Plants need for photosynthesis get inside the leaf. The ants. The. The answer is these is these things. Things. These are called stomas. What the stoma does. Us is let the necessary ingredients for photosynthesis just 
flood says go into the leaf. Into the leaf. This means the carbon dioxide side can enter into the to the stomas to the carbon dioxide and water can enter through the stoma must to get must to get to the plant's chlorophyll factories. Well, actually not. Actually, I have said it wrong. The material, the seal, the the carbon dioxide and water enter into enter into the chloroplasts, the glucose factories where where photosynthesis is, is performed. Now, the reason why chloroplast is not shown in this diagram is because because it's because while chlor chloroplasts do exist in leaves, it's, it's, in order to to see them, you need to zoom down to the individual cell. Now, now there are many parts to a plant cell, but cell. But when it comes to the photosynthesis, this this one, this part is the most important. is is by far the most important for photosynthesis. This the chloroplast has to, has to captures sunlight and and is the plant's glucose and and makes the glucose. Let's, Yes, glucose is actually made inside the side the chloroplast. This thing capture the, the chloroplast captures sunlight and makes glucose out of it. As well as water and oxygen. Oxygen. If you look that, look back at get the photosynthesis equation. So, what is photosynthesis? In summary, photosynthesis synthesis is, is is a process in which plants and algae use to make their their food to make nutri nutrients to survive. Now for the final question. But why is it so important? Why is it so important for photosynthesis to be able to occur? To answer that, we need to look at a food chain. This is a isn't to look at the food chain. Without since if photosynth without photosynthesis Plants wouldn't be able to make their own food, which means animals would, which means herbivores would, would die out, which means the animals that eat those herbivores would die out, and, you know, and the domino effect would, effect would affect every living organism on Earth. So yeah, without photosynthesis, life on Earth would go extinct. So, yeah, photosynthesis is actually way more important to life on Earth than you would have ever realized. But speaking of, of life on Earth, these next two videos are about one group of, of organisms that I don't nearly give enough credit on this channel no, for how important they are. Microorganisms. These next two videos just explain all of the amazing ways microbes influence the food we eat. First, next stop, why spoiled food isn't always a bad thing, part one. Now, spoiled food is usually thought of as a bad thing, being commonly associated with diseases and food poisoning. But microbes in your food aren't always a bad thing, and some foods, such as coffee, bread, cheese, beer, and even chocolate, can all get their signature tastes, textures, and smells from microorganisms. So without further ado, here are seven examples of how microorganisms influence the food you eat. 
Meat left out on the counter for months on end is usually seen as extremely dangerous. And with bacteria like E. coli and Salmonella running around in there unchecked, it's easy to see why. But meat left out on the counter for months on end is actually what salami is. Let me explain. You see, salami is often cooked with lots of salt, a deadly toxin to microorganisms that kills the microbes that would otherwise cause the meat to spoil. What this does is that it allows for salt tolerant but totally harmless microbes to take over, eating sugars which are usually dextrose and producing lactic acid. And very uncoincidentally, this lactic acid is actually what gives salami its signature flavor. So the next time you're enjoying salami, be sure to give thanks to these, these friendly microbes for, for giving salami its signature flavor. Right before they're roasted, coffee beans sometimes go through a, fer a process of fermentation. What this is, is that the fermentation process is caused by microorganisms breaking down the mucilage layer here of here surrounding the coffee bean. And these microbes also suppress the growth of pathogenic fungi and create the signature flavors and smells of coffee, sometimes even, even actually boosting the flavor of said coffee. So the next time you have a nice hot cup of coffee in the morning, Give thanks to fermenting microbes that make your coffee smell and taste the way it does. Bread, too, is also a product of microorganisms, and one of the most famous products of microbes at that. Except this time, it's not bacteria, mold, or fungi, it's yeast that's at work. Because once it's activated, this yeast feeds on the sugars in bread dough, and burps out bubbles of carbon dioxide that makes bread rise. This yeast also releases other chemical compounds to give us many of the distinct flavors and smells associated with bread. So what that means is, is the hard-working yeast is to thank for, for your delicious loaf of bread, or whatever you choose to make with it. There are many different types of cheese, and different microbes are responsible for different types. Blue cheese, for example, is made by mold spores being mixed into the milk fermenting it and giving the final product if its rich, funky flavor. And if you've noticed that your blue cheese absolutely stinks, well, microbes are also to blame for that, because the bacteria that cause blue cheese to be super stinky are also the, the same bacteria that cause foot odor. Yum? But bacteria do more than just make cheese absolutely stink. In fact, microbes can also be thanked for giving Swiss cheese its signature holes. That's because these holes are caused by bacteria in the cheese. He's burping out carbon dioxide bubbles that then pop and give Swiss cheese its signature holes. But basically, any kind of cheese is basically milk that's been fermented by some sort of microbe, be it bacteria, yeast, or fungi. This one may seem like a surprise to many, but there are a lot of microbes to thank for your delicious bar of chocolate. This is because bacteria and yeast ferment and eat sugars in cacao beans. Yes, the same beans that are used to make chocolate. This, in turn, mellows out bitter polyphenols and other bitter compounds, and creates the rich, complex flavor of chocolate that we all love and crave. Including me. It should come as no surprise to basically anyone that beer is a fermented beverage. And boy, is there a lot of microbial action at play in your beer. You see, beer is made when brewer's yeast feeds on the sugars in the wort, converting those sugars into ethanol and making beer alcoholic. The yeast also releases flavor compounds that give beer its signature taste. So, the next time you catch yourself enjoying a cold one, if you're 21 and up, that is, be sure to thank, thank that hard-working brewer's yeast for giving beer the flavors you love. Well, again, if you're 21 and over, that is. Finally, we come to wine, one of the most common alcoholic beverages in the world. This quote-unquote grown-up grape juice is made very similarly, similarly to beer. 
that being that yeast break down sugars in the grape juice and convert them into to ethanol, or alcohol for those of you who don't speak science like I do. This, in turn, gives you wine. But the fermentation process also has a different effect, releasing aroma compounds. You see, the fermentation process also releases aroma compounds called stereoisomers, or however, or however they're pronounced, which give wine its signature flavor. So yeah, that was part one of why spoiled food isn't always a bad thing thing. But there is actually a part two to that series as well. Watch this next video to find out that about seven more of your favorite foods that are made possible by microbes. Now, you may remember that I previously posted a video on the same topic as this one. Microbes influencing the food you eat. But the reason I'm posting a part two, that would be this video, is that there are quite a few foods that I left out of the first video. Most of them fermented. So without further ado, here are seven more examples of microbes influencing the food you eat. This one shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, but kimchi is actually quite well known for being a fermented vegetable dish. Here's where the microbes come in. You see, the type of fermentation that turns vegetables into kimchi is called lacto-fermentation, which is so named because those lactic acid-producing bacteria metabolize carbs and sugars in the vegetables, producing lactic acid as a byproduct that is responsible for kimchi's signature sour flavor and acidity, as well as inhibiting the growth of microbes that would cause was the kimchi to spoil. And by the way, the process used to make kimchi is very similar to that used to make sauerkraut, which will make an appearance later in the video. So the next time you eat kimchi, be sure to thank the microbes that make it possible to enjoy this delicious dish. Another famous food made by hard-working microbes Yogurt is yet another dairy delight created by the likes of lactic acid producing microbes. Here is how the transformation from fresh milk to delightfully smooth yogurt plays out. You see, once fresh milk is pasteurized, homogenized, and cooled to anywhere from 40 to 44 degrees Celsius, lactic acid producing microbes are put in. At this point, the microbes, just like in cheese, convert the milk sugar lactose into lactic acid. This process causes the milk to thicken and develops the finished product's texture and taste, eventually giving you the final product of yogurt. So while the concept of bacteria in your yogurt seems absolutely disgusting at first, in reality, it's these very microbes' hard work that make yogurt what it is. As one of the lesser known fermented foods on this list, kefir also has a lot to thank from the bacteria that turn kefir grains into fermented kefir milk. The fermentation process starts when bacteria in the kefir grains use the sugars, there's glucose and galactose in the kefir grains to jumpstart fermentation, after which the microbes release the enzyme lactase which breaks down the milk sugar lactose in the grains, producing, you guessed it, lactic acid. These bacteria also produce byproducts such as acetaldehyde and various antibiotic compounds, which make the milk more acidic as well as inhibit the growth of spoilage microbes. So whenever you do try to decide to try this fermented dairy beverage, be sure to give thanks to microbes for making this fermented dairy drink possible. Now, unlike most of the fermented foods on this list, vinegar is actually fermented not once, but actually twice. That's right, this sour, tangy, and very popular condiment is actually fermented two times, not once. Here's what you need to know about vinegar's double fermentation process. During the, first time, vin during the first time vinegar is fermented, yeast break down the plant sugars found in foods like fruits, whole grains, and potatoes, 
and convert them into ethanol, all through just about the exact same mechanism by which the beer and wine, which I mentioned in the first video, linked in the description below, are made. During the second time vinegar is fermented, acetic acid bacteria, which produce acetic acid, convert the ethanol into the signature flavor compound in vinegar, acetic acid, which gives vinegar the signature sour and tangy flavor it's known for. Moving on to something you probably never even knew existed, kombucha is a fermented tea drink that's made using the ingredients of sugar, tea, and of course, fermenting microbes. There are three main types of microbes that ferment the sugary tea and turn it into kombucha. Acetic acid bacteria, which are also used in vinegar, yeast, which is also used in beer and wine, and lactic acid bacteria, which are also used in most other foods on this list. With, it's, these three types of microbes work together to ferment a sugary tea, producing ethanol, or alcohol if you don't speak science, and resulting in the tea beverage becoming lightly alcoholic as a result of the fermentation process used to make it. So whenever you decide to try this weird and slightly alcoholic tea drink, thank microbes for making this not very well-known tea drink possible in the first place. This one may or may not come as a surprise, but sauerkraut is in fact a fermented food made from shredded cabbage leaves. And there are actually two types of bacteria involved. First, anaerobic bacteria that are naturally present on the cabbage leaves produce lactic acid, all while completely using up what little oxygen is inside the airtight container and replacing it with carbon dioxide. Eventually, though, the inside of the jar becomes too acidic for these bacteria to handle, and they die. Then, species of lactobacillus that also produce lactic acid, but can better handle the acidity, are added in, fermenting any sugars remaining in the cabbage and producing yet even more lactic acid, which is responsible for the signature acidic and tangy taste of sauerkraut. Technically speaking, there are two main ways to make pickles. Quick pickling, by which cucumbers are soaked in salty brine that contains acidic vinegar, and fermenting, by which fermenting bacteria are used as, a, as the acid source instead of vinegar. For this video, we'll be focusing on fermenting. In fermented pickles, the bacteria at play are yet again lactobacillus, but they cannot get to work right away. Because first, the cucumbers are soaked in a salty brine to kill harmful microbes and create the right environment for the lactobacillus to do its job. Then, those same lactic acid-producing lactobacillus bacteria ferment the sugars in the cucumbers, producing lactic acid as a byproduct and turning the and giving the finished product a sour, tangy, and acidic flavor. Moving to something unrelated to food for once, let's talk ranking metals. I've done it quite a, a few times on this channel, and this next video is the oldest metal ranking video I have I made so far, the first part of my ranking metals from least to most dense series. So without further ado, let's dive into the video. Now, there are many different types of metal, metals out there. They're from everyday stuff like iron and copper to, or to really rare and valuable stuff like, of like gold or silver. And, the, and you may notice that these, that these types of metals vary a lot in between in things like color, textures, relative hardness, and some other factors. So it should be no surprise that all these metals differ wildly when it comes to density. For those of you who don't speak science, density is density is is the concept of how heavy something is for its size. And while some metals are really light, others are ridiculously have are ridiculously heavy for their size. So in today's video, we're gonna be ranking thirty gonna be ranking thirty different metals. It was based on, it's done from least to most dense. One more thing before we start, 
but I will not be including the metal alloys such as bronze, steel, or brass. These are all combinations of metals. Combinations of metals. And so these will will, will not be included on included in this video. Only only metals that you can find on the periodic table will be on here. So without further ado, let's get started. At the bottom of the of the metal density ranking is lithium. Lithium is the simplest el element on this this list since it's the simplest element that can be considered a metal. It's a soft soft silvery white metal though that's in the alkali earth metal metal group on the periodic table. Well, that's widely used in batteries, but not the kinds you're probably thinking of. See, the batteries you're probably thinking of are nickel-cadmium batteries, which contain, well, nickel and cadmium. But where lithium truly shines is in, is in, is, is in lithium-ion batteries, which are much smaller and generally used for for handheld devices, such as smartphones and the iPad that I'm recording this on. So yeah, even though even though lithium is very useful, it's the lightest it's the lightest metal on this list, with a density of only 0 0.534 grams per cubic centimeter. And it just so happens that that the next metal on this list is lith is lithium's next door neighbor on the periodic table, beryllium. It's a it's an, it's another silvery white metal that's a, well, that's relatively soft, soft, and it's often mixed in alloys with copper and nickel to make all sorts of things. Lots of stuff, and I mean a lot of stuff, not in batteries, batteries, but still, well, beryllium can be used to make a lot of stuff, soft, despite it being re being in one of the more simple elements out there. Now beryllium. Well, beryllium is also also has a very low density. See, and considering it's it's the simplest element, it's, it's the second simplest element element on this list. That didn't come as a surprise. Yes. Beryllium's density is density is one point eight five have grams per cubic centimeter, which is not a lot. Next up in line, line, line for this density. City ranking is aluminum. Aluminum is one of the most widespread metals out there. There, and it's used in, used in well, basically almost basically a lot of things. Things that 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 use metal. It has an atomic number of number of thirteen. Thirteen, and and it's also really common in the Earth's crust. In fact. So common, in fact, that it's actually the that it's actually in the top ten mo ten most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. Just just for a reason, and if not the fact that it's super common. Aluminum is also not too dense, with a density with a density of two point seven grams per cubic centimeter. So aluminum is denser than. So then simple lithium and beryllium, but nowhere near as dense as other metals on this list. Coming up after aluminum is a is an element much rarer in the Earth's crust, cadmium. This is somewhat rare metal. Well, it's primarily used in those nickel cadmium batteries I talked about. About. And and cadmium is also really toxic. With cadmium being classified as a classified as a known carcinogen. carcinogen. But despite its toxicity, the cadmium's use in batteries makes it one of the most useful, useful elements of the modern world. Cadmium um, also isn't very um, despite its pretty heavy the atomic number of forty eight is actually Actually, pretty light, with a density of of only four point zero four seven grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on the 
But on the on the metal density ranking is titanium. Yep. It is titanium has an atomic number of twenty two, and is a tran and is a transition metal, so with a white, silvery, silvery and metallic color. It's strong, lustrous, lustrous and corrosion resistant, making it, making it one of the most making it one of the strongest naturally occurring elements on Earth. However, titanium is is not the strongest metal, naturally occurring element on Earth. Stay tuned for that one. But it's also so not so anything but the densest. With the density with it, the density of only we four point five zero six grams per cubic centimeter meter titanium is actually pretty pretty light for how strong it is next up is gallium now even though gallium is more than twice as dense as aluminum it it's anything but uh, hard gallium will actually turn into a liquid in your hand and that's because as gallium gallium you know, turns into a liquid at a temperature Temperature above 29.76 C. That's lower than your normal body temperature, which is 37 C. See, and because of that, gallium will turn into a liquid in your hand. And, and, but even if it's solid, gallium is is still really weak. So weak, in fact, that you that you can cut it with a knife. A knife. So yeah, even though gallium is gallium is really soft, weak, and malleable, well, gallium, gallium is still more than more than twice as dense as aluminum, with a density of of five point one grams per cubic centimeter. And it just so happens that the, that the next metal on this list is only two short steps away from gallium on the periodic table, arsenic, with an atomic. With an atomic number of thirty-three, arsenic is one of the most toxic elements on plan on planet Earth. It's used in a wide variety of of of, of products that in, that involve killing something stuff, such as pesticides and rat poison. So not to mention drinking water contaminated with arsenic is arsenic is is a it's a deadly danger. Especially in, especially in poor or less developed nations. So yeah, arsenic is some real toxic stuff, and it's and it's definitely one thing you should not play around with. And with, it's because it's so damn toxic. Ars, but despite its its toxicity, arsenic isn't that dense, with a density of only. 5.727 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this this list is zirconium. Zirconium is zirconium is a strong and malleable metal. It's also ductile, lustrous, lustrous, and a grayish white color in its pure form. In its natural form, zirconium is primarily a reddish brown, a reddish brown. But that's only because the uh, zirconium you know, is often ex been blended it into a mineral called called zircon, which is really rare and often you and often sold as a gemstone. It's some it's it's pretty soft. It's soft when it in pure form, but um, but because it it's often full of impurities, he's it's brittle and hard. Zirconium is is of medium medium density with a density of six point five one grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on the on the, the metal density ranking is antimony. Antimony is in a group on the periodic table called called the metal called the metalloids, meaning meaning they have a, both a metallic and a non metallic form. In its metallic form, um, antimony is bright, silvery, very hard, and hard and brittle. While in its non-metallic form, it's just a antimony is nothing more than a gray powder. 
Antimony is actually really rare. Rarer than tin, arsenic, and all and almost all of the rare earth metals. Despite it being one of and despite its rarity, it's one of the most important elements out there. There. Antimony ne has, a has a density that's somewhat similar to zir zirconiums, with a, den with a density of 6.697 grams per cubic centimeter. Coming, coming up after antimony is, is zinc. Now, when you're probably thinking of zinc, you're thinking you're probably thinking of it as a, it, as a, as a mineral that you need eat, eat for your body. But zinc is actually a metal, metal that exists. It's, it's silvery white with a blue tinge, and although it doesn't rust, it does tarnish in air. It does tarnish when exposed to atmospheric air. Most of the most zinc used today is used used to galvanize metals such as iron and prevent them from rusting. Zinc. Zinc is not that is not that rare compared to other their metals. So it's some so it's a somewhat rare metal. Zinc is also so quite dense with a density of 7.13 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on the, next up is chromium. Chromium is chromium is is lustrous and silver gray, and is and is also very brittle, and hard. Unlike zinc, it doesn't it doesn't tarnish in, tarnish in air, and it's pretty and it's quite strong. In fact, chrom. Chromium is actually used in the manufacture of stainless steel. And it's also used to, used to harden steel. In, in steel. So yeah, chrom, chrom, uh, chromium is also so used to coat, coat, coat things like cars, stoves, and other appliances to prevent, corro to prevent corrosion. Chromium also has is also fairly dense with a density of 7.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Coming up right after chromium is it um, is its next door neighbor on the periodic table, manganese. Manganese is 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 pinkish gray and chemically active for an element. It's very hard and brittle. Oh, and hard to melt, but it easily oxidizes. This is meaning it rusts just like iron. When when pure, manganese is highly reactive. Dip and dip and also tarnishes when exposed to air. And, and being a next door neighbor to chromium, it shouldn't be surprising that manganese isn't that manganese's density isn't that different from chromium's, with a density of seven point two six grams per cubic centimeter. Next on the next up on this list is tin. Now you're probably familiar with tin in the form of tin foil, you know, almost like how you're. Like just like like aluminum foil, but unlike aluminum, which is pretty much everywhere, tin is actually at least somewhat rare, with a concentration in the Earth's crust of only two parts per million. For comparison, lead has a concentration of twelve parts per, mil per million, and copper has a concentration of sixty-three parts per million. That's really rare for a metal that you that isn't really thought of as rare, like gold or silver. Nevertheless, tin is still many times more common than, than metals like gold, silver, or platinum. And, 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 it, no, wait, no. and in fact, gold, sil gold and platinum both have less than one part per million in the Earth's crust. Tin is also fairly dense, 
with a density of 7.1 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is, a, is, is Tin's next door neighbor on the periodic table, indium. Indium is one of the softest metals out there, so soft that you could that it's actually the only metal you can successfully bite in half. If even though you will, it'll probably it'll break a sweat while trying to do it. Indi indium just barely makes it into the list of, list of the top 10 most expensive metals, with a, with a cost of $11 per troy ounce. But despite this relatively cheap price compared to gold or something, there's some other rare metals, Indium is shockingly rare, here, despite its low price. And, and, and as you might suspect from, from, next door, from periodic table next door neighbors, here's, indium has the exact same density as tin, with a density of 7.31 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is iron, and steel for that matter, considering steel is just carbonated iron. Iron is one of the most versatile metals out there, and considering it's one of the most abundant elements in Earth's crust, it's no surprise that iron and steel are two of the least expensive metals on Earth. And although iron is super versatile, it does rust when it come in, comes into contact with oxygen. So... Oh, iron is often mixed with carbon to create steel, a, a metal alloy that's resistant to rusting and rusting and rusting is one of the strongest materials on Earth. Iron has iron is has a medium density, with a density of seven point eight seven four grams per cubic centimeter. Steel has the exact same density as iron because again. Steel is really just iron with extra carbon added to it. So that was part one of ranking metals from least to most dense summarized. But there isn't just a part one to that series. There's also a part two to that series, which is going to be the next video. So without further ado, watch this next video to find, find out about the denser end of the metal spectrum. Now, if you remember, last week I posted a video called Ranking Metals from Least to Most Dense Part 1. Well, well this week I'm going to be posting the Part 2 to that, ranking the other 15 metals that I, that I did not mention in that previous video. Because I was going to... because I knew covering all 30 metals in one video would take up way too much time. So I decided to split it up. 15 medals for part 1, and 15 medals for part 2, which is this video. So without further ado, let's get to the ranks. Continuing from where I left off in part 1, we have nickel. Nickel is a silvery white lustrous metal that, that occurs in naturally in relative abundance in the Earth's crust. I mean, being the 24th most abundant element on Earth, Earth does count for something. However, just like with iron, there is something about nickel you should understand. Nickel is 100 times more concentrated in the Earth's core than in the crust, which means most of, most of the Earth's nickel is actually unminable, because it's because as most of Earth's nickel is in the form of molten molten nickel in the Earth's core. Nickel is a moderately dense metal that's denser than quite a few metals, but is but is still oh pretty light, with a density of 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on the metal density ranking is nickel's next door neighbor on the periodic table, cobalt. Cobalt is a hard, lustrous, lustrous and silvery gray metal with the, the atomic number of 27. Now, now, as battery technology increases and as electric vehicles goes grow in popularity, the demand for cobalt is, cobalt is rising. But despite this, this the world isn't, is, it isn't expected to run out of cobalt anytime soon. Because cobalt, 
Cobalt is definitely not rare, being the 32nd most abundant element on Earth. Earth counts. And being the 32nd most abundant element on Earth means means we won't be running out of cobalt anytime soon, despite our growing demand for it. Right in use with batter in use for batteries. Cobalt has the exact same density as nickel, with a density of 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is another one of one of nickel's next door neighbors on the periodic table, copper. Copper is a reddish metal that's extremely ductile with the atomic number of 29. Copper is Copper is unusually good at conducting electricity for a metal, which is why it's often used in electrical wiring. Now you might be wondering, why is copper used in cookware? The answer to that is also pretty simple. Because copper also conducts heat really well. As in, it trans cop a copper pan or pot transfers the heat, heat directly from the stove to your food, making it excellent can get an excellent material to make cookware out of. Copper isn't much denser than nickel and cobalt, with a, with a density of 8.96 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is, is the first truly rare and valuable metal on this list, silver. Silver is one of the most highly sought after metals, but I'm, it's partially because it looked just really pretty to look at. But silver's beauty isn't the whole story. Silver is also quite rare, with a concentration of only, zero, only 0 0.075 parts per million in the Earth's crust. And while that isn't as rare as you think, think considering gold, platinum, and palladium are all rarer, for silver is still really rare compared to metals like Metals like iron, lead, aluminum, and copper, which are some of the most abundant metals on Earth. Silver is the first metal on this list with a density of over 10 and grams, with a density of 10.49 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is a metal that's way less desirable than silver in basically every way possible. Lead. Lead is one of the most notoriously toxic metals on Earth. And although its, it's toxic, toxicity is very slow acting, once it does manifest itself, you are dead. So you might be wondering, why is this metal often used in pipes? One, when back when those pipes were being built, people didn't realize how toxic lead is. And two, lead has a low melting point and is super malleable, meaning you could bend it into all sorts of, sorts of pipey shapes. In fact, the word plumbum, which, um, which the words plumbing and plumber come from, um, is actually just Latin for lead. Talk about relying on a toxic metal for your, for your pipes. Lead is also so pretty dense with a density of 11.347 grams per cubic centimeter. Going back to precious metals, next up on this list is palladium. Palladium is one of the most rare and valuable metals on Earth. It's rarer than platinum, which is why it's become as no surprise that it's more valuable and worth more than, or than platinum um, could dream of being. That also clears up why palladium is more expensive than platinum. Palladium is the third most expensive metal on Earth, whereas platinum um, is only the fifth most expensive metal on Earth. Palladium um, is one of the... Palladium is the most expensive of the big four. The big four are the, are the four most precious and valuable metals on Earth those being gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And out of all of them, palladium is the most expensive and the most valuable. Palladium is also so pretty dense, even more so than silver, with a density of 12.02 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is ruthenium. 
one of the lesser known precious metals that isn't as well known as gold or platinum, but is still you know, pretty rare and valuable. It, it just barely manages to make its way into the top five most expensive metals on earth. But, but still, being the sixth most expensive metal on earth does count for something. Despite being many times more common than palladium, ruthenium is actually more, actually more dense, but just. Ruthenium isn't that much denser than palladium. Yeah, despite the fact that palladium is many, 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 many times rarer than, than ruthenium, gold, silver, or even platinum. Like I, meant, like I just mentioned during, during that segment of the video. Ruthenium is um, is somewhat rare, and it has a density of tw of twelve point two grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is rhodium. Rhodium is one of the rarest and most valuable metals on Earth. And although I'm I'm still very much so unsure about whether the rhodium is um, is more rare than palladium, um, rhodium. The fact still remains that rhodium is many, many, many times more expensive than palladium. One troy ounce of rhodium will cost you $13,800 worth for a single troy ounce. For comparison, in a one troy ounce of palladium will cost you $2,797, which, while still a lot, is nothing compared to rhodium, which costs... It's around four times more. In fact, rhodium is so expensive that it's, it's actually three times as expensive as the next most expensive metal, that being iridium. Rhodium is also pretty dense, with a density of 12.41 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is mercury. Mercury is a metal famous for being a liquid at room temperature. Unlike ga that's not like a gallium, which is still a solid at room temperature and only melts when you put it in your hand. Oh, and if you were to put mercury in your hands, yeah, bad idea, because mercury is one of the most toxic elements on Earth. Unlike, ga unlike gallium, which is completely non-toxic, mercury is a fast-acting poison that can kill you even if you just touch it. Mercury is one of the most toxic elements on Earth. And it's also one of the weirdest elements on Earth. Considering, I mean, well, it's an effing liquid at room temperature, even though it's a, even though it's a metal. But despite this metal... But despite this metal being a liquid at room temperature, mercury is still pretty dense, with a density of 13.59 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is the first and only radioactive element on this list, uranium. Uranium is well known for being the fuel in nuclear reactors, but as far as nuclear bombs go, there's a bit of controversy. You see, even though uranium is used in these bombs, um, the primary radioactive element in these bombs is actually plutonium these days. And to be real, plutonium isn't that far away from uranium on the periodic table. Uranium's atomic number is 92, whereas plutonium's is 94, so not too far away. But I should note that unlike uranium, which occurs naturally, plutonium um, is man-made. Because in, in actuality, uranium is actually the heaviest the element that occurs naturally in the Earth's crust. Any, any element heavier than uranium is man-made. Uranium is also pretty dense, with a density of 19.1 grams per cubic centimeter. Next up on this list is what's probably the strongest metal on Earth, tungsten. Now, in part one, on when I was talking about titanium, I did mention that titanium... Um, although strong, was is actually not the strongest metal on Earth, and I, and I said, I'd stay tuned, and to find out what it is. Well, this is it. Tungsten is the official strongest metal on Earth.
In fact, tungsten rings are so oh, strong, you can't cut them with, well, anything. Well, almost anything. Thing. They're about as indestructible as the metal you can get. And even more so than titanium or even steel. Tungsten has an atomic number of 74, and, is, and, and that W comes from the fact that it's often called Wolfram. Tungsten is only slightly more dense than uranium, with a density of 19.24 grams per cubic centimeter. Coming up after tungsten is a metal that, although much weaker and more malleable, is way more valuable. Gold. Gold is one of the most highly sought-after metals because, one, gold is very shiny, lustrous, and pretty. And two, gold is really, really, really rare. I mean, 19th rarest element on Earth rare. Gold has a concentration of only 0 0.004 parts per million in the Earth's crust. For comparison, sil sin silver has a concentration of 0 0.075 parts per million, which should really tell you, you something about how rare gold is. By the way, the AU you see for gold in the periodic table is actually based off the Latin word aurum, which is the Latin word for gold. Gold is actually the fourth densest metal on this list, with a density of 19.32 grams per cubic centimeter. Taking third place on the metal density ranking is platinum. Now, despite common belief, platinum is actually more common than gold. Yes, I just said platinum is more common than gold. But don't get your hopes up, because as platinum is only very slightly more common than gold. Platinum has a concentration of 0 0.005 parts per million in the, the Earth's crust, compared to gold's 0 0.004 parts per, per million. This makes platinum the 20th rarest element on Earth, and the 5th most expensive metal on, on Earth, with a price tag of $960 per troy ounce. For comparison, gold is the 4th is the most expensive metal on Earth, with a, with a price of $1,789 per troy ounce. Platinum is the 3rd densest metal on this list, with a density of 21.45 grams per cubic centimeter. Taking the silver metal of the densest metals on Earth is osmium. Osmium is in a group of metals that's famed for being rare and valuable. This group contains eight different metals, all of which are rare and valuable to different extents. And don't get me wrong, osmium is a really rare metal, and one of the eight metals in that group. This group also contains seven other really rare and valuable metals, many of which I've actually already talked about in this video. These include, these seven others include ruthenium, silver, iridium, platinum, palladium, gold, and rhodium. Osmium is the seven, is actually the seventh most expensive metal on Earth, with a price of around four hundred dollars per, whereas for a single troy ounce of the stuff and with a density of 22.5 grams per cubic centimeter, it would take the number one spot if this last metal didn't exist. Taking the number one spot as the densest metal on Earth is iridium. Iridium is so dense that it can even beat out osmium when it comes to density. And it turns out iridium isn't just a normal rare metal like gold, silver, or even in ruthenium or osmium. No, it's the f***ing rarest metal on Earth that isn't radioactive. It's many times rarer than gold, silver, platinum, or even palladium. Yeah. Did I ever forget? Oh, and it would be criminal for me to not mention the fact that it's the second most expensive metal on Earth, with a bank-breaking price of $4,000 for just a single troy ounce of iridium. With a price that expensive, only rhodium can afford to be more expensive. And not only is iridium the rarest metal on Earth, it's also the densest, with a density of 
to 0.65 grams per cubic centimeter. Finally, to wrap up this first science compilation, we're gonna go back to food, back to food for this last video. GMOs. Should you actually be, actually be scared of them? Watch this next video to find out. GMOs are one of the most hotly debated topics in science. While some say they can do, do good and help to save the world, others say they're a big mistake that can bring death and disease across the globe. So who's right? And what are GMOs anyway? So first, let me get one thing straight. What are GMOs anyway? GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, are, are, are exactly what they sound like. Organisms that have had their, their genetic code edited to, to code for certain traits, like, like producing poisons that kill insects or, or being, being resistant to a certain weed killer. Because there are so many different traits that can be encoded for when it comes to GMOs, those, they can be used for bad just as, as well as they can for good purposes. One of the most, most notorious bad uses of GMOs is Monsanto's Roundup Ready Seeds. These seeds are genetically engineered to be resistant to the wheat, to the herbicide Roundup, which has been, been shown to poison the environment and cause, cause can conditions like cancer and birth defects. These Roundup Ready seeds allow farmers to spray the weed killer, killer all over the place, poisoning the environment and, and poisoning consumers as well. However, there are also good uses for GMOs. Golden rice, for example, well, is genetically engineered rice that's engineered to have more vitamin A in it. Another example is, well, is genetically engineered cows that are that are, are engineered to produce milk free of allergens, meaning, meaning even people with a dairy allergy can enjoy this stuff. And it's for this reason that, and that there's that the answer to whether GMOs are good or bad is is far from clear cut. I mean. In sure, GMOs can be used for some pretty bad things, but they can also be used in positive ways. However, if you're still looking to avoid GMOs, then I have both good news and bad news. The good news, at least in the US anyway, there are only 10 GMO crops available for sale in the USA. These include corn, cotton, canola, summer squash, soybeans, sugar beets, apples, papayas, potatoes, and alfalfa. Okay, so that, so can, so that might, might lead you to think that GMOs are easily avoidable, but it's not so easy. As, as many of these GMO crops regularly find themselves in our food. GMO corn, soybeans, and canola oil regularly find, them, find their way into processed food products. And GMO corn and soy is often fed to livestock. Meaning, meaning your meat or milk is probably contaminated with GMOs. Now, like I said, said at the beginning of the video, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. GMOs those by themselves will no, won't hurt you. You, in fact, they can be used for pretty amazing purposes, like to infuse use food with nutrients or to to make it more tolerant to climate change. But as always, there's a bad side to this argument. I'm saying that because, like I said at the beginning of the video, GMOs can be used for bad just as easily as they can good. Just take a look at Monsanto's Roundup Ready seeds. It's, they're genetically engineered to be resistant to the herbicide Roundup, which, which has been, been shown several times to cause, cause, cause conditions like cancer and birth defects. So these Roundup Ready seeds allow farmers to use the herbicide widely. And this is bad news. It's not just for people, but also for the environment too. So the bottom line is, 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 as far as GMOs go, 
it's not the GMOs that are bad themselves. It's what we do with them that makes GMOs good or bad. Now, oh, there are plenty of records of GMOs those being used for, for bad purposes. It's like allowing farmers to spray, spray carcinogenic weed killer everywhere, but there are also so GMOs that do good in the world. Rice, for example, is being genetically modified to find to be and to be higher in beta carotene. Carotene. This is this is known as golden rice, and it can be be really helpful in developing countries. Countries that usually have we have poor eyesight and other and other vision and other vision problems due to lack of vitamin A in their diets. However, there's one other the trait that that rice is being genetically engineered for. Resistance to climate change. Many different strains of, strains of climate metadapted rice have been, been bred to be resistant to droughts, floods, and other natural disasters, allowing, allowing farmers to grow farmers to grow rice en masse and keep the population fed. Another much more famous example of, of GMOs being used for good purposes is BT crops. BT crops have a gene borrowed from the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis that allows us to plants to produce chemicals that are poisonous to insect pests, yet completely harmless to us. This can drastically reduce insecticide use, allowing for more sustainable farming that doesn't, doesn't leach as many toxic chemicals into the environment. But like I said, it's a double-edged sword. Some, some insects, like the corn rootworm and the cotton bollworm, have started to develop resistance to the, resistance to the to BT crops. And, and they might pose a real problem from even with these GMOs in place. These help safeguard from other insects. So, to put this video to an end, let's go back to our original question. Are GMOs good or bad? Well, it depends. GMOs those, those can allow you to introduce a wide array of traits into an organism. So, and those traits can be either good or bad. So, well, the final answer to this, to this question once and for all, well, are GMOs good or bad, is it's not the GMOs themselves that are good or bad, but it's what we do with them that is good or bad. So there you have it, a science compilation covering, covering a lot of my favorite videos about science on this channel. We hope you enjoyed this video. As always, make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned for a second science compilation coming next week. Bye! <clears throat>